uh, find it here. And where do I start? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so today um, I'd like to talk uh, about um, our recent research on colored gems, gem deposits, and how to explore for them. And I'm going to start by talking about beryl and the gem varieties of beryl. Uh, I'm sure as you all know, beryl is a beryllium aluminum silicate mineral. And uh, down the lower left, uh, this is what the crystal structure looks like looking down the, the C axis. And it's made up of SiO4 tetrahedra joining together to make these rings. And these are Si6O18 rings. And the middle of these rings are these large channels where we can put uh, water molecules and, and large cations like, like sodium. And the rings are held together by aluminum in octahedral coordination and by beryllium in distorted tetrahedral coordination. And uh, here's another a model of the crystal structure. And down in the lower right, looking at the crystal structure from the side, from perpendicular to the C axis, here are the rings and here are the aluminum octahedra that are holding them together. And uh, in this diagram, we don't see the, the beryllium tetrahedra. Most substitutions in the barrel structure happen at the aluminum site in these octahedra. Um, but we can also have lithium replacing beryllium in the distorted tetrahedral sites. And uh, I talked already about substitutions in the channels. And there's an interstitial site between the aluminum octahedra which also takes part in some substitutions. It's a site that is usually empty. So this is the crystal structure of beryl. When we talk about the gem varieties of beryl, there are a number of them. The most important, of course, is emerald. And emerald gets its green color from chromium and or vanadium replacing in those octahedral sites. We also get aquamarine, which has the blue color. And it's blue because of iron replacing aluminum at the aluminum site, but also in that interstitial site that's usually empty. And what happens is an electron hops back and forth between those two sites. And that leads to the blue color. And this was only determined about 10 years ago, that before that, we didn't know what was responsible for the blue color in aquamarine. We also have the, the golden or yellow varieties of beryl, golden beryl or heliodor. And the golden color comes from, from trivalent iron replacing aluminum. Goshenite is, is uh, colorless beryl. Morganite is, is pink. And it's pink because of divalent manganese. Now, if we replace aluminum, which is trivalent, with a divalent cation, then we add a sodium atom uh, in the channel for charge balance. And then the final variety is red barrel, which is red also because of manganese, but in this case, it's trivalent manganese, which again replaces aluminum at the octahedral site. Now, the most important gem barrel is emerald and uh, generally considered the third most valuable gem after diamond and ruby. The pricing of emeralds is unique in the colored gem market because it emphasizes color almost to the exclusion of other characteristics, characteristics such as inclusions and fractures. Um, here are the two, uh, two most valuable emeralds. The one up here is the Bulgari emerald, which holds a record for the highest price ever paid. And these are all in US dollars, so a little over $6 million. And uh, here's the Rockefeller ring which set the record for the highest per carat price paid for an emerald, a little over five and a half million dollars. Now today, I'm also going to talk about the gem variety of corundum. Corundum is simpler. It's only uh, composed of aluminum and, uh, and oxygen. And it often forms hexagonal dipyramids as shown down here. Um, and often they, they form a, a barrel shape with horizontal striations. So they have a very distinctive crystal form. 
Now, corundum makes a, a very good gemstone because it's extremely hard. And it's extremely hard because it's composed of aluminum in octahedral coordination. And these aluminum octahedra are, um, are very tightly packed together. And in fact, because of this, corundum has a hardness of nine, second only to diamond. And the gem varieties of corundum are ruby and sapphire. And we have ruby here on the left, where the chromophore is chromium and sapphire on the right. And the chromophore in sapphire is iron and titanium, divalent iron and titanium. Now, all other colors of, of gem corundum are called fancy sapphires, and they're named on the basis of color. So this one down here is called a yellow sapphire. And later on, we'll talk about pink sapphires. The uh, exception to this is the orange sapphire down here, which is called Padparadsha. And that's a uh, name for uh, the lotus blossom, which apparently has a similar color. So these are the gem varieties of, uh, of corundum. Now, Ruby and Sapphire are the most important colored gemstones in the gem trade. And up here we have uh, the Sunrise Ruby, which set the world record price of 32.4 million in 2015. And uh, below we have uh, the Bluebell Sapphire, which is almost 400 carats and sold for $17.3 million in 2014. So today we'll be talking primarily about emerald, sapphire, and ruby. Now, gems are very important to, to geological science as well. And this is because they represent very unusual geological conditions. And the example I use is emerald. Emerald is rare everywhere except Colombia because, because they represent very unusual geological conditions. To get emerald, you need beryllium to make beryl, but you also need chromium and vanadium to give the green color. And these elements occur in very different geochemical circles, very different environments. Gem deposits can also give us information about tectonics, sometimes on a very large scale. For example, ruby is a really good indicator of continental collision because most ruby deposits occur where two continental plates collide. And uh, in a paper we wrote in 2013, we came up with the term plate tectonic gemstone. And the examples we used were jadeite up at the top, which indicates uh, where an oceanic plate is, is subducted below a continental plate. That's where we find jadeite jade. And again, um, the example of ruby and sapphire gem corundum occurring where continental plates collide. So gems can tell us quite a bit about tectonics. Now, gem deposits can generally be divided into magmatic and metamorphic. And uh, we have really good examples with emeralds. Most emerald deposits are associated with granitic intrusions, as shown on the left. The example here is from uh, the Yukon in Canada. I'll talk about it more later. But there we have a granite. And as the granite magma crystallized, the, uh, we had a formation of a residual liquid, up to 10% water. And the, the elements that, um, that uh, concentrated in this, in this fluid are the ones that don't, that don't really like to go into crystal structures until very late in the crystallization sequence. And these, uh, these uh, elements became concentrated in this, this uh, residual liquid and uh, finally escaped the granite following fractures in the host rock. And uh, as, uh, as they cooled, formed different, different minerals. In this case, we had beryllium and boron in the fluid and it escaped the granite into a mafic schist. And there was an aplitic phase, a pegmatitic phase, but then it just became a quartz vein. And on the margins of the quartz vein, we have formation of emerald, where the beryllium came from the granite, but the chromophore came from the mafic schist. So many 
emerald deposits are magmatic in character. However, in Colombia, as I'm sure you know, which produces the world's finest emeralds, there is no evidence for magnetism. The emeralds in Colombia are metamorphic. They formed as a result of hydrothermal growth associated with tectonic activity. And on the right, you can see the quartz calcite veins in a black shale. And, uh, and there's, um, there's a, an emerald crystal in here somewhere. I can't see it now. But, uh, but in Colombia, a number of studies had, have indicated an evaporitic origin for the parental fluids. And these fluids can contain up to 48% sodium chloride. So they're, they're, very, um, they're very saline and very corrosive. And these fluids liberate the beryllium, vanadium, and chromium needed to make the emeralds from the black shale. And uh, probably also organic matter plays an important role. But all of the things needed to make the emerald are within the black shale itself. So here we have magmatic emerald deposits versus metamorphic emerald deposits. And in the latest classification of emerald deposits, which we published in 2019 in Giuliani et al., that's the, the main um, the main subdivision at the top, you can see that uh, tectonic metamorphic versus tectonic magmatic. So metamorphic and magmatic. And down here we have Columbia under metamorphic. And over here we have the uh, Sadek Lisa deposit in, in, in Yukon, Canada, which I used as the example of the magmatic type of deposit. So we can generally divide gem deposits into metamorphic and magmatic. Now the examples I'm going to use uh, from here on are from Canada because it's where I live and where I do most of my work. And um, Canada has the world's second largest landmass, so we should have a lot of colored gems, but this isn't happening yet, that they haven't been they haven't been discovered, but uh, but there have been recent discoveries that hold out hope that we will eventually produce colored gems. And uh, there are a number of reasons why, why we're, we're not uh, doing that yet. And one is simply the size of the country. It is, uh, as I said, the world's second largest landmass, but very, very um, underpopulated. For example, here is a uh, Columbia for scale. In Columbia, there's 44 people per square kilometer. In Canada, there's only four people per square kilometer, and most of them live along the border with the United States. So a very small population density. There are other reasons why there have been few discoveries. Um, the climate. In Canada, you can only really work uh, during the summer months because of most of the country, um, there is snow in the winter and it's very cold. And uh, and also, because there's so few people, there's a very limited infrastructure, um, especially north of 60 degrees in northern Canada. In fact, in all of Nunavut, shown in yellow here, there are no roads connecting any of the, any of the communities, so that all travel is by boat or by aircraft. So low population, poor infrastructure, climate. There's also a lot of forest cover and glacial uh, deposits as well. All of these uh, conspire to make it difficult to, for exploration. What holds out hope though, is that uh, in the 1980s, a number of diamond deposits were discovered in Northern Canada, especially north of Yellowknife here. And, uh, and now Canada is the second largest uh, producer of diamonds by value. And, uh, and so that will tell hope for colored gem deposits. Now in the examples I'm going to talk about today, most are from the Yukon Territory up here in the far left uh, and a little bit into the Northwest Territories. Um, Yukon is a very large but area, by area, but has a population of only 35,000 people. I will also have examples from Baffin Island over here in uh, Nunavut, Southern Baffin Island and uh, some from central British Columbia. And uh, I'm talking to you today from Vancouver, which is, which is right here. And, uh, but my first example is going to be from Northern Ontario. And this was the first emerald 
occurrence recorded in Canada. It was discovered in 1941, and uh, it's called Taylor II. And it is a um, classic uh, magmatic related emerald deposit where a pegmatite shown here intruded host rocks containing lots of chromium and vanadium. These are chlorite schists and metavolcanic rocks. So the pegmatite intruded these, these, uh, these um, mafic rocks and where they connected, we call the zone of mixing where the geologist is standing in this black area is where the two connected. And the beryllium came with the pegmatite and the mafic rocks contain the, the chromium and vanadium, maybe mainly chromium in this case. So if we look closer at the zone of mixing, that's shown right here, and you can see the emeralds. Most of the rock is made up of uh, feldspar, large potassium feldspar crystals, and uh, a matrix of albite with mica and uh, tourmaline. And here's what the, uh, what the emerald looks like. The um, <clears throat> occurrence is very small, but it has produced a, a limited number of, uh, of, of emeralds. So that was Taylor II. Now we're going to go up to the Northwest Territories. And uh, in 1997, emerald was discovered at a locality called Lined. And in this case, the emeralds are vanadium dominant. So the color, the green color, color comes mainly from vanadium. And the emeralds occur, occur in quartz calcite veins, cutting a uh, scarn limestone. And there's about 35 subparallel veins that you can see in the in the outcrop. And so they're quartz calcite veins, similar to what you have in Colombia, but uh, but the host rock is different. And our research shows that the beryllium is actually coming from a, a nearby granite. So this is a again an example of the magmatic type. And uh, but the chromophore, the vena vanadium is from this black shale or mudstone in the foreground. It has up to about 3,000 parts per million vanadium. So Lynette, another example of a magmatic emerald deposit. Now, the most important discovery um, uh, was 1998 in the Yukon Territory, um, a, a deposit that eventually became known as Sadek Lisa which in the, in the local Indian language means place of green stones, which is appropriate. And in 1998, one of my students was walking, was prospecting through the, the talus right here, and he was actually looking for lead and zinc, but instead he found these, these large green crystals and uh, sent some of them to me at UBC, and I x-rayed them and confirmed that they were beryl, and so emerald. And uh, what we see at Sataglisa is, and again, this is the di diagram we looked at earlier, we have emeralds associated with quartz veins coming from a nearby granite. And uh, the, uh, the fluids contain beryllium, but also boron. And so there's also quite a bit of, of tourmaline. And the green color is from chromium in the, uh, in the mafic schist. And, uh, so again, this is the magmatic type of emerald deposit. Now it turns out it's a very large deposit. There is a lot of emerald at Sada Glisa and the color is quite good. The problem is that after the emeralds crystallized, they were shattered by tectonic forces. The deposit is very close to a major fault system. And so these crystals, even though they can be quite, uh, quite large when you pick them up, when you try and facet them to make gems, the, you quickly find that they're, they're full of fractures. And so the largest emeralds cut from the Sada Glisa material are only about two and a half carats. And most of the, most of the uh, crystals are, or most of the stones are like this. Um, these are only 0 0.1 carat stones. Um, the longest dimension here is about three millimeters. And so the company that had the property tried to make this melee jewelry and tried to market it, but there wasn't enough of a market. And so in the end, after spending about $15 million and spending about 10 years, they, uh, they decided that they, they could not open a profitable mine. And so the, uh, they, um, they dropped the project. 
and it's unfortunate, but that this is the closest Canada has come so far to having uh, an emerald mine. So those are um, three recent examples of magmatic emerald uh, emerald occurrences in Canada. Recently, there's been a fourth, and that is in Nunavut, a place called Enuri, which is a gold property. And the company drilling there in um, uh, around uh, in 2012 discovered emerald in their drill core. And this time the emerald is in a comatiite, which is made up of, uh, you can see all these amphiboles, these, uh, these amphibole crystals, and also associated with, with pyrite. And uh, so the emerald is found at depth in uh, three of these drill holes. And uh, the, uh, the chromium, chromophore, is, definitely, is, is uh, undoubtedly coming from a comatiite. We're not sure about the beryllium, but probably from a nearby tonalite, which would mean that this is also a magmatic type of deposit. Now, we don't know if the emeralds show up on surface, and I, I really want to go to this locality, but it's very hard to get to. It's several hundred kilometers from the nearest, uh, the nearest uh, town, and so you have to get there by airplane or helicopter, and uh, it's very, very expensive. But I'm hoping to go there perhaps next summer. So that's another example. But the most, probably the most exciting discovery was in 2007 in the Northwest Territories close to the Yukon border. And this is uh, emerald found in extensional quartz carbonate veins in sandstone and siltstone at a place called Mountain River. And uh, they're not really great samples. They're not very transparent, but uh, they're a good size. But the most important thing is that there is no magmatism anywhere in the area. So it turns out that these are metamorphic emeralds. And in fact, probably the first metamorphic emerald de deposit outside of Colombia. And uh, a student uh, um, named Hewton worked on this for a master's project and uh, developed a model that is very similar to what we see in Colombia, where we have these warm brines um, in the basin that that uh, that ascend through the through the host rocks, and they they scavenge the beryllium and the chromophores from the sedimentary rocks to form the emeralds. So uh, so it's most likely tectonic metamorphic related, like the Colombian emerald deposits. And we'll come back and talk about this more in a few minutes. But now I'd like to talk about gem corundum deposits, which again can be divided into metamorphic and magmatic. Now, magmatic sapphire is common in some parts of the world, such as Australia, and uh, one spot in North America, Yogo Gulch in Montana, where the sapphire occurs as xenocrysts in uh, a rock called a wichitite, which is a type of lamprophyre. And so um, this is what it looks like in the rock, and this is what it looks like uh, in the uh, trauma mill. And they have a very distinctive color. They call it cornflower blue and a very flat morphology or shape. But that's about the only occurrence of magmatic gem corundum in North America. So there's very few magmatic deposits, but quite a few metamorphic gem corundum occurrences in, uh, in uh, North America. And I'm going to start by talking about the uh, sapphires on Baffin Island in Nunavut. And these were discovered in 2001. And uh, you can see what um, the, uh, the, what the area looks like. This is called the Beluga Pit. And uh, this is where they were discovered. And you can see the rock is a very unusual, um, it's a mottled color. And we have uh, almost a purplish brown color and then the white. And the sapphires are found in the white parts, and they they look like this, and this is what they look like when they're cut. And uh, now uh, the company that uh, optioned the property and did a lot of work on it um, found not only blue sapphire but also colorless and yellow. And they actually found quite a few occurrences, um, as shown on the map here, 
and uh, they have blue. They also found some pink, yellow, and uh, blue spinel, which we'll have a look at in a minute, and scapolite. The uh, dark green uh, um, points that you see all over the map here are scapolite. And that's important because they, they discovered that the, the sapphire occurs with scapolite. And so if you can find the scapolite, it usually has sapphire associated with it. And uh, um, all of these um, minerals occur in, in the Lake Harbor group, which is mainly marble. And uh, so how did they form? Now, it turns out it's really quite complicated. And one of my students worked on this for his PhD. And uh, he, uh, this is one of his slides showing a polished thin section and you can see the corundum is here. And uh, he showed that it formed through three different metamorphic reactions that had to occur in sequence. And the first reaction was formation of nepheline diopside and potassium feldspar at peak metamorphic conditions. And this formed from a, a, a dolomitic argillaceous marl. So the protolith was a, a like a clay rich dolomite um, material. And uh, at peak metamorphic conditions, we had formation of nepheline diopside and potassium feldspar. Then we had partial retrograde replacement of this assemblage by phlogopite, oligoclase, calcite, and scapolite. And uh, he was able to come up with a date and a temperature and pressure estimate. Then we had further breakdown of the scapolite plus nepheline to form albite, muscovite, the sapphire, and calcite. So we had these three sequential reactions taking place. And one of the key things is that the corundum only formed in a 100 degree window. So a very narrow temperature range. So no wonder it's so rare. A lot of things had to happen to form the, the gem material. And uh, you can again see the corundum here. Um, the nepheline uh, is all broken down to a mixture of clays and, and other things. And so the corundum is mostly following fractures in the, in the uh, original nepheline. So uh, very complicated sequence. Now, uh, close to that, um, the, to that, to the beluga pit, we all pit. We also find, uh, we also find these outcrops, and uh, you can see that there's kind of a bluish tinge. As you get closer, you can see crystals, blue crystals. Even closer, this is what they look like, and this is a centimeter scale. And it turns out this is spinel, which is composed of magnesium, aluminum, and oxygen. So instead of just aluminum and oxygen, we add magnesium, probably because the protolith was more of a dolomite than a, than a marble. And the color is from cobalt. And uh, this material is extremely valuable. The uh, largest stone here is only uh, 0.16 carat, but is probably worth more than $10,000 per carat. Um, and uh, I don't think any of it's been sold yet, so I don't know for sure. But uh, it's remarkable that in this one little area, we get all that sapphire plus this cobalt, cobalt blue spinel. And this is all an indication that Southern Baffin Island is a really good target for finding more gem, uh, gem corundum and spinel. Um, there's other places in Canada that contain uh, gem corundum. The goat claims in British Columbia contain pink sapphire some of which is red enough to be called ruby. And uh, you can see one in the foreground here in marble. They are in uh, politic layers in this marble. And you can see the band extends all the way and up, up here into the distance. And uh, on our side, we have nice. And this was discovered in, uh, this was discovered in 2002. And uh, uh, one of my students studied this for her PhD and uh, she found that the, the corundum formed from breakdown of muscovite again at peak metamorphism. And uh, the, uh, she found that the, the, the chromium and vanadium necessary to give the color 
uh, occurs in volcanic layers within the marble, that there was a volcanic clastic component to the original rock. And so when we're exploring, we look for these, what we call these dirty layers in the rock that uh, contain the original uh, muscovite and the chromophores. And the most recent discovery, again, is in British Columbia. And uh, the, uh, this is called the Blue Jay Claim. And this time it's sapphire and uh, just discovered in 2019. And uh, the Blue Jay um, location is right here. And it's right on the edge of a metamorphic core complex called the Thorodin Dome. And what we just looked at, the, the pink sapphire and ruby, is from the goat claims, which are associated with the Frenchman's cap dome. And these are, again, metamorphic core complexes, which feature very high metamorphic grade. The peak metamorphism was quite high and high enough to give us these gem corundums. And uh, we're just starting to work on the blue jay claims, but the uh, corundum is in Boudans in, the, uh, in a biotite nice and uh, also associated with lots of, uh, of garnet, and, uh, but um, we're just starting to work on it. Now I'd like to shift to talking about exploration. How do we find these things? And uh, I'm going to start by talking about magmatic emeralds. Now, when my student discovered the emerald at Sataglisa in the Yukon in 1998, I started wondering about how we would explore for more because in many places in the world, Colombia is a really good example, where you have one emerald deposit, you have more, and you just need to find them. And uh, because I knew that Sataglisa and uh, Lynette were both magmatic, um, I started um, developing ways of looking for magmatic emerald deposits. And I thought, well, first of all, we need beryllium, and uh, most of the beryllium in the Yukon Territory is associated with, Pluton with uh, these uh, mid-Cretaceous plutonic rocks. And then we need the chromophores, chromium and vanadium. So we need to look at ultramafic rocks, volcanic rocks, and these black shales that are very high in vanadium. And they're shown in purple here. And when we put the two together, that should indicate where we should look. So. Uh, Using this technique and also looking at, uh, at uh, exploration reports and things like this and looking at geology in more detail, um, we came up with 100 targets to look at. And in the summer of 2003 and 2004, we obtained funding from, a, from some companies to go looking. And uh, so we had 100 targets to look at. We only made it to 20. Remember I mentioned how difficult it is getting around up there. And uh, most of the time you have to travel by helicopter. And uh, here's myself and three of my students. And, um, and there's two main ways of, of, uh, of exploring. One is by prospecting, but another is by taking silt samples or heavy mineral concentrates from streams and then sending them to be analyzed for the uh, for, well, to be chemically analyzed, looking mainly for chromium and vanadium. Unfortunately, beryllium doesn't, uh, it's a very light element and it's, uh, it's not easy to analyze accurately. So we did both these things, uh, prospecting just using our eyes, but also collecting silt and heavy mineral concentrates. So uh, we didn't discover emeralds, unfortunately, but we did discover an aquamarine occurrence a volcanogenic massive sulfide prospect and a sediment hosted nickel copper cobalt occurrence. And this goes to show that if you are exploring for gems and you can also find other things. I mean, the, uh, the important thing is to get out there and start looking. So that's exploration for magmatic emerald deposits. The discovery of the mountain river uh, occurrence um, led to a reevaluation of the potential for metamorphic emeralds in uh, northwestern Canada and uh, for more Colombian type emeralds. And uh, so one of my students, Donald Lake, um, uh, worked on this for his master's thesis. 
And he uh, realized that the, um, these black shales in uh, Northwestern Canada are mainly associated with the ancient Selwyn Basin, and that's the blue outline. And all the gray are the uh, black shales. And uh, that uh, the area to be looking at is mainly east of the Tintina Fault. This is a large fault that cuts across the Yukon Territory. And that I mentioned before is responsible for shattering the Sataglisa emeralds. Sataglisa is about here on the map. Um, so uh, this is a very large area. Here is the uh, emerald um, area in Colombia to approximately the same scale. And so you can see that the areas are, are roughly the same size. And, uh, but, um, uh, and uh, so Donald um, not only did this work, he, uh, he went to Colombia and he spent time with the miners at uh, Muzo, I believe. And he looked at the literature and the idea was to look at how mining exploration is done in Colombia and then try and apply the same criteria to Northwestern Canada. And uh, what he discovered was that uh, the important points are in Colombia, the sodium content of the stream sediments, lithium, sodium, and lead in soil samples, gypsum and anhydrite deposits, which, which uh, provide evidence for evaporites, um, structures such as thrust faults, and the presence of cogenetic minerals such as fluorite, fluorapatite, and uh, rare earth bearing uh, minerals like parasite and fluorinsite in the heavy mineral concentrates. So putting all of this together, he, he applied this to what data he could find about Northwestern Canada and came up with three main areas to look at, number one, two, and three. And you can see that uh, Mountain River is right in the middle of number one and Lynette is here and Sataglisa are here. So we have three, three emerald occurrences and, uh, and these three prospects based on um, largely on, on techniques used in Colombia. So uh, the next step should be, go, should be to go and look and find, see if we can find emerald deposits. The problem is that the area is greater than 15,000 kilometers and there's almost no roads and so everything would have to be done by, by helicopter. The other thing is that to cover such a large area, we probably need to collect heavy mineral concentrates and silt samples from these streams and rivers. But instead of analyzing them chemically, which uh, isn't going to be all that helpful, we need to develop a way to analyze them for the minerals and the compositions of those minerals. And so right now in my, in my laboratory, we're building an instrument to analyze silt samples and to use Raman spectroscopy and laser, um, laser uh, induced breakdown spectroscopy to analyze individual particles in the silt samples for emerald and for anything else. So, so we're doing this right now to come up with it, to develop a technique to actually explore this large area um, efficiently. So that's exploration for metamorphic emeralds. How exploration for corundum? Now I mentioned there's not much magmatic corundum in Canada, so we're not looking for it, but we are looking for more metamorphic corundum. And here's a map of Baffin Island again, where, we, where uh, we've been studying the uh, sapphire and the spinel. And what, uh, what uh, my student Phil Belay discovered was that the, again, that the sapphire occurs at peak metamorphism. Well, the only place in the, this area we can uh, attain peak metamorphism is with this thrust fault that uh, separates the Lake Harbor group in yellow from the Narsajuac arc in pink. So only along the thrust fault do we get pressures and temperatures high enough to form sapphire. And uh, so the next step is to go back up here and explore along the thrust fault to see if we can find more. But there's another way that, uh, another technique to use, and that is, uh, that is UV light. Or, and uh, I mentioned that, uh, that in the Baffin Island occurrences, we have a lot of scapolite associated with the sapphire and the scapolite fluoresces in UV light. And so the company that was working up there 
that the people in the company, they used UV light in headlamps to explore for the scapa light. And that's what we see here. The pink is the scapa light. And so they would go out at night and uh, identify the scapa light and then go back during the day to, to determine if there was any sapphire associated with the scapa light. So they were doing this on foot using uh, headlamps with, uh, with UV emitting LEDs in them. Uh, but another one of my students uh, decided to look at whether we could use satellite imagery and, uh, or maybe even um, collect data using aircraft or drones, but to look at uh, other areas of the, uh, of the, the spectrum, in particular, the shortwave infrared spectrum. So he took samples in the lab, and uh, here's a sample of the rock with the uh, little corundums right here. And this is what it looks like in UV. You can see the scapolite. But in uh, the shortwave infrared, you get a much more complicated image. And he was able to divide this up into different domains. And the domain four is the one that contains the, uh, the, uh, the corundum. And so we want to go back to Baffin Island and use um, satellite and airborne imagery to, to and shortwave infrared to try and find more, more uh, sapphire. Um, back in British Columbia, um, again, the Blue Jay claims and the, the goat claim up here, um, I mentioned that these are associated with these core complexes that uh, feature very high grades of metamorphism. And so we want to go back and explore around the margins of the core complexes to see if we can find more. So uh, this um, obvious places to look for, for this metamorphic corundum. And another thing we've been doing for exploration that's been very effective is using drones. And uh, these pictures are not of uh, Emerald of Corundum, but of uh, Peridot, which is uh, a gem variety of the mineral olivine. And there's a lot of it in British Columbia. And my students have been using drones to explore for these, uh, these uh, mantle xenoliths in lava flows. And uh, what used to take two weeks to do to explore an area now takes two or three days using a drone. And so, uh, and uh, we recently published a paper um, in uh, uh, Journal of Gemology gemology about using drones to uh, explore for for um, for peridot. So uh, there you go. I, I hope I've given you um, some examples of, uh, of uh, what we're doing in Canada to describe and to explore for more colored gem deposits. And uh, obviously many of these techniques I think could be used in other countries. And uh, and again, not only to, to explore for gems because they're beautiful, but also because they can tell us an awful lot about the uh, geology that they occur in. So um, thank you very much for the invitation. And, uh, and uh, I'll just mention here, I was, I was in Colombia for the Second World Emerald Symposium in 2018 in Bogota, and I really, really enjoyed it. You have a, a beautiful, wonderful country, and I, I hope to come visit again someday. Thank you. Okay. okay. Any uh, questions? Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say that. So, um, si alguno tiene preguntas, eh, pueden, pre pueden hacer sus preguntas de una vez um, aquí por el chat y nosotros. Ah, oh, alguien hizo una pregunta aquí. So someone has a question and I'm gonna read it. It says, have you done any geophysical survey? We've done some, that's a good question. Uh, mainly, um, mainly gravity and magnetics and uh, they can definitely help with um, magmatic emerald deposits they can help show where the edge of the granite intrusion is and uh, give you an idea of where the granite ends and the host rocks begin. So we've done that. Um, otherwise, we have access to government geophysical surveys 
that show us basically large areas, but they're not fine enough to, to really help much with, with exploration. Okay, any, any other questions? <laughs> Okay, so we're ready to see if uh, people have more questions. Um, I think there are no more questions. Mm. Okay, you can always email me if you think of more questions later. And uh, um, I hope if there is a third world Emerald Symposium that I will be able to come to it in, in in Colombia, and uh, um, and uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you again. <laughs> well, thank you for for your um, talk and for um, your attitude, sharing us your knowledge, and it was a great um, talk. So thank you. So how can we like communicate to like email you? Oh yeah, let me just type in the chat. I can provide. Okay. Uh, it's just groat at uh, mail.upc.ca, and so um, yeah, simply uh, yeah, I typed that right, didn't I? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question. Yes, please. ¿Alguien escribió que tiene una pregunta? ¿Alguien tiene una pregunta? No es pregunta, pero okay. uh, it's not a question. Uh, only say that it's very interesting. And the baddest thing I learned about Canada is that half the, half the year it's too cold. So this yes. is a good reason to stay in Colombia. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but we have other nice things, and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> and you're welcome soon. To well, be here I, once I, again. I'd love to. I, I said I, I, I had a wonderful time in Bogota. I did not go outside, but uh, outside of into the countryside, but it was a uh, um, it was an excellent conference, and everybody I met was so nice, friendly. And, so, uh, yeah. So we wait for you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd love to come. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you very much. Thank and, you, uh, Professor Groth. Um, and we hope you have more spaces like this one. It was, it was a very good space for everyone to um, learn something new. Uh, so thank you for that. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you again sometime. Okay. Oh, there was a question. Uh, yes, what about the emeralds? Oh, okay. Hold on a second. Are you still there? Um, yes, uh, there was a question about emeralds in the um, in the, the USA, there are uh, emeralds in the Eastern United States, which are magmatic type. And in uh, Utah, uh, uh, a very small number of metamorphic um, emeralds were described, but uh, my students went back to the locality and uh, they couldn't find any, and in fact, the geology does just doesn't look right for uh, for metamorphic type deposits. So, uh, so we actually haven't seen these. That's right. Yeah, um, we. Uh, yeah, no one else has described these emeralds, and so we. Uh, I've discussed this quite a bit with my colleague uh, 
Gaston Giuliani, and both of us agree that it's, it's, uh, yeah, we, these Utah emeralds, we would need to know more to, to uh, agree with it. So, great. Okay, thank you, uh, Catalina and Santiago, and uh, um, yeah, the, uh, so um, any more questions or? Uh... I think someone uh, texted something. Okay. Or, I don't know if it was, yeah, the same person that asked the last questions. Yeah. Um, oh, no, that, that, that was part of the question. So uh, okay, that was if, part if of the question. Someone has any question or if there's no more questions, we, we can end the meeting now. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, and uh, have a good rest of your day and nice to meet everybody and hope to see you again. Okay. Hey, nice to meet you. Bye, teacher. Bye, Professor Grove. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>